Well, welcome everybody both physically here and then you folks online watching. Today we are going to get into Judges chapter 14. Last week we looked at chapter 13 which which talked about the birth of Samson and, and uh, the angel of the Lord visited his parents and so they're kind of the main focus of that chapter and and now they're hardly going to appear. Uh, it's all about Samson in this chapter and in the chapters ahead. So let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, tonight as we dig into your word, and as we see a man who kind of just does what he wants, uh, open our eyes to your leading in our lives so that we are, we are following you and not asking you to catch up to us. It's so easy to do that. Uh, we pray that you would help apply your word to our daily lives so that we find encouragement and strength as we go home this evening. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. We'll have to work hard to find the encouragement for this. Uh, Interesting chapter tonight. Okay, so anybody have an opportunity this week for a prayer, a conversation, a meeting with someone who needs Jesus? For, for our family, it was other family members. We were up at my dad's memorial service. and um, I did have an opportunity to talk with... Um, what do you call it? The, the guys who work at the, at the funeral up there in Seattle. And we got there super early, which was nice, and, and just standing around talking. They're super nice guys, and they might even be members of the church. I'm not sure. I, I don't know. Uh, but we got to talk, and, um, and uh, I was just able to share with them how, in the midst of our grief, we know that my dad is with the Lord, which the Bible says is better by far. And they really, that really resonated with them. And so those moments of sadness or difficulty can be great opportunities to share hope with people. So I want to encourage you to have your ears and eyes open. We talked about that in our Acts Bible study this afternoon. Paul is shipwrecked. He's in this ship. It runs aground. Everything falls apart in the ship, that is. But God said, nobody's going to die. Nobody did. And then Paul had an opportunity over the next three months to share the gospel with people. And so one of the, the things we said is, isn't that amazing? God uses shipwrecks to spread the faith. Yeah. And, and so God can use anything. And you never know uh, who you might talk to tomorrow. So keep your ears open, your eyes open. All right. Judges 14. I have to come up with an interesting title every week. At least I think I do. So A Marriage, a Riddle, and Violence. How's that for an interesting title? Yeah. It sounds like an HBO miniseries, right? Yeah. Something like that. Um, and, and so that's what we're going to see tonight. And, and really, marriage could be in quotes, because this is, this is weird stuff. So let me get right into the introduction. Chapter 14 introduces a whole bunch of questions and doesn't give answers to all of them. For example, we don't really know the Philistine culture as well as we know the Israelite culture, because the Philistine culture is not written about in the Bible extensively. And, and so there's stuff going on in this wedding, and we go, now, is that, is that just normal custom, or is there something sinister going on? And I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, we'll get into that in a few minutes from now. Um, it, it gives questions about what is God doing? And in fact, I think I have that written down here. Um, so the divide between Samson and the Philistines begins and grows in chapter 14. And what we're going to see is just as he lives more and more and more, the animosity between Samson and the Israelites and the Philistines begins to grow. Uh, and this, this chapter leads us to grapple with difficult thoughts also about God's intervention in human activity. We are going to see God in the background. And, and for example, um, Samson goes to marry a Philistine girl. And, and of course, uh, a Hebrew was supposed to marry a believer. It didn't mean they had to be ethnically Hebrew, but a believer. And he's not doing that. And he's a judge. Right? He's a judge, a leader. Uh, and then it says, but this is what the Lord had in mind, basically. And so it's like, well, so God's breaking rules now? I, I mean, how do, you, how do you deal with that? And we'll, and we'll look at those verses. And then finally, I, and I should have put this in the introduction, and Ruth kind of spurred a thought in my mind a few minutes ago, so I wish I had, but I did. So I believe it's back in chapter 2. We learn about the first judge. He's a guy named Othniel. Othniel does kind of everything right. He marries the daughter of Caleb. And, and if you know the history of Israel coming into the Promised Land, there were 12 spies who checked out the land. And do you remember what 10 of them said? It was too dangerous. Yeah, it's too dangerous. The, the, the Anakites live there, and, and they're giants, and we're, they're going to crush us like grasshoppers. They actually use the word grasshopper. And two guys, Joshua, who is Moses' right-hand man, 
And then Caleb say, wait a minute. The Lord can do this. Why do we doubt? They were the only two. And so Caleb is kind of this hero, this faithful guy. And Othniel marries his daughter. So he does all the right stuff, right? Yeah. And he, he's judge number one. Guess what number judge Samson is? We talked about this last week. He's number 12. 12. And so there's a judge for every tribe of Israel. And so the author puts that together, not by accident. So you look at number one and number 12, and we've seen this downward spiral in the book. And things are getting worse in Israel. And so we get to this last guy, and he's kind of a jerk. And he's a leader of Israel, supposedly. So that's what we'll see tonight. Okay, maps are always fun. So last week, uh, we saw um, Samson and his parents kind of over in this area. And we get into chapter 12, and the wedding stuff is going to happen here at 10 now. That's why I circled. Um, here's a couple of main Philistine cities. They have five main cities, Ekron, Gath, Ashkelon, and I forget the other ones. Um, but they're going to come into play. Uh, Ashkelon is actually over here uh, later on. The Shephelah, by the way, this is a, it's a geographical term. It's kind of a dry plain below the mountains. And so our text says that Samson went down to Tim. That means he's up in the foothills and, and he goes down. And for Jews, you all, you're always going down to leave Jerusalem. Why is that? Because Jerusalem's the high point. Even though it's not the geographic highest point around there, it's the high point. And so he goes down to, to Tim. Now. Okay, Judges 14, 1 to 2. Somebody want to read? Stephanie, thank you. Samson went down to Timnah and saw there was a young Philistine woman. When he returned, he said to his father and mother, I have seen a Philistine woman in Timnah. Now get her for me as my wife. Yeah, so he's very polite, isn't he? Yeah. I see woman. I want woman. Get woman for me. That's kind of how he talks. <laughs> so we see some boundaries crossed here. What are the boundaries? Well, there's a geographical boundary. Samson goes down to Timnah. He's leaving the land of Israel. And you can't really call it that yet because it's not all one big happy nation under a king. But he's leaving Israelite territory, sort of. Um, and he's going down into Philistine territory. And I say sort of because if you look in your Bible at the beginning of chapter 13, go ahead and page back. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. So the Lord delivered them into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. And so, uh, who's in charge here? Well, kind of the, the Philistines are. The, the Philistines were just a really, they were like the Assyrians, if you wanted to give a comparison. They were a, a really tough group. They, they were, were very tough. They were, they, were, they, were, they, were, they were kind of cruel, if you will, um, just as a, as a... Yeah, as probably a, not quite as cruel as the Assyrians. The Assyrians would impale you. The Romans crucified you. The Assyrians would put you on a pole to kill you. Mm -hmm. Uh, but yeah, the Philistines were rough and tough. Um, they're called, they're probably to be identified with uh, a more ancient documents talk about the Sea Peoples. Mm -hmm. And there's decent evidence that, that they actually may have been Greeks leaving Greece during the height of their powers. And you notice that they have, they have their five kind of city-states. That's a very Greek way to organize. And, uh, and, and in fact, when you read in, in 1 Samuel, you have the, the princes or the rulers of the five city-states. So it's very Greek in, their, in the way they did things. And if that's the case, the Greeks were very good at warfare, especially the Spartans, as, as you guys probably know. So they may have been um, related to Greeks. Now, Samson sees a woman. She's never named in the chapter. The whole story, she's never named. And I find that very, very interesting. And so the emphasis in here is how Samson treats her as an object. And we talked at the beginning of our study how the book of Judges portrays women and, and their mistreatment, but also some of their great strength and um, uh, what am I trying to say? Creative intelligence. You know, they, they figure stuff out. But here's one of those times where a woman is just, she's like property. And so that's kind of interesting to see how Samson does that. Her ties to her people are emphasized instead. And we'll see that in verses 17 and 18, especially. And what's very, very interesting is that Samson makes demands of his parents. And when you look at the language, how did, how, did, how did Samson ask 
to have this woman be his wife. Get her. Get her. <laughs> Do this. I, I, I guess the parents had to be involved at least in some small way. Typically, the usual custom was for parents to choose a spouse for their children. And that sounds to many Americans reprehensible. But, you know, you look at the batting average for marriage today versus 150 years ago, it's not the worst thing in the world. Um, and, and so Samson is a strong character. He does what he wants. Okay, anything else in here? Uh, oh, so some stuff that I probably should have written in your study guide, but I didn't. So who was Samson supposed to marry again? Someone from his own tribe. Yeah, but well, believer. Doesn't have to be an Israelite, but a believer. And so Samson goes after a woman who's not a believer. What had Israel done all these years? Yeah, they were supposed to be faithful to Yahweh. What do they do? The, the Hebrew actually says they went whoring after other gods, or they prostituted themselves. Different translations say it differently. But they're, they're going after these other gods, and God throws up his arms and says, you know, what are you doing? I brought you out of Egypt. I wooed you in the desert. He actually uses language like that. And so um, that's something to notice here, too. He, he reflects what Israel has done. Uh, let's see. He sees a woman. That's what it says in the text. Just, it, it appears to be more lust than love. And so that's what he does. All right, verses 3 to 9. Does someone feel like reading? Otherwise, you listen to my voice droning on very softly. Oh, okay, go away. But his father and mother said to him, Is there not a woman among the daughters of your relatives or among all our people that you must go and take a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? But Samson said to his father, Get her for me, for she is right in my eyes. His father and mother did not know that it was from the Lord, for he was seeking an opportunity against the Philistines. At that time, the Philistines ruled over Jerusalem. Then Samson, over Jerusalem or over uh, Israel? Sorry. Okay. Then Samson went down with his father and mother to Timnah, and they came to the vineyards of Timnah. And behold, a young lion came towards him, towards him roaring. Then the spirit of the Lord rushed upon him, and although he had nothing in his hands, he tore the lion in pieces, as one tears a young goat. But he did not tell his father or his mother what he had done. Then he went down and talked with the woman, and she was right in Samson's eyes. After some days, he returned to take her, and he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion. And behold, there was a swarm of bees in the body of the lion and honey. He scraped it out with his hands and went on, eating it as he went. And he came to his father and mother and gave them, and gave some of to them, and they ate. But he did not tell them that he had scraped the honey from the carcass of a lion. All right, thank you. So I always wondered why that's in the Bible. Why is that detail there? Tonight we're going to find out. So Samson overpowers pretty much everything. Uh, Samson's response to his parents, they say, why can't you pick a girl who's a believer? you got relatives. you got a whole clan here. Uh, it reflects Israel's response to Yahweh regarding foreign gods. I'm here. I love you. I brought you into the promised land. No, no, no. We want to worship the Baals. We want to worship the Asherahs. And, and that's what they did. Now, I'm glad Wayne's translation. You have the ESV translation, I'm guessing? Yes. So I'm really glad uh, my NIV, uh, which I like because it's a little more readable than the ESV, but but uh, the NIV says something like, you know, she seemed right to him. But the, the ESV captures that phrase from the book of Judges. Twice it says she was right in his eyes. Remember that phrase we've looked at? Uh, so again, if you go back in your Bibles to uh, Judges 13, verse 1, we just read it, right? Again, the Israelites did evil in... Eyes. The eyes of the Lord. And the very last verse, if you look at the last verse of Judges, so go page to chapter 21, verse 25, it's the last verse of the book. What's it say there? In those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit. Yeah, and what does it say in the ESV? Oh, I so I caught you, didn't I? 
again. So 2125, the last verse of the book. And in those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Yeah, and we have, to, we have to hear that language because it gets repeated over and over and over in the book in different places. Mm -hmm. And so Samson does what is right in, in his eyes. And I got to thinking about this. Let's see if I wrote it here. Yeah, so I got to thinking about this. How are some postmodern values today similar to Samson's attitude? What do you hear in uh, the political world, in the world of philosophy and conversation on talk shows, talk radio, internet postings? And maybe you don't read that stuff. It's probably good if you don't. But are you hearing any of this stuff? You know, one of the things that I hear all the time um, from parents in various organizations that I'm in, you know, when I invite them to church, or oh, we got this nice Sunday school program here at Small, it's so great folks, and oh, well, I'm going to let my kids yes. uh, wait till they're older to decide <laughs> what religion they want to be. Yep. And, uh, you know, I think of all the... Uh, I said, well, in the Bible, it says that as parents, we bring religion to them and teach them. Right. But, you know, but you kind of have to. But, you have to be you careful. You plant that seed. You yeah. can teach their own. You know, that, but, you know, you know but that, that's one of the things that bothers me is that postmodern attitude is that, oh, we'll just let them decide later on. And, of course, Sundays are not holy anymore. How many no. organizations that I belong to that organize stuff on Sunday morning? That's because the one morning we haven't completely filled in, so we can yeah, do stuff then. Yeah. So what's the, that's a great example. What's the underlying belief in our culture? The true point of reference that matters. That's right. So there, there's no real truth. But when you grow up, when, you, when you're 16, you can decide if you want to go to church or not. Or when you're 21 and you're an adult, then you can decide. And, and that's such a, a bedrock part of our culture. Nobody even notices anymore. Uh, for example, if you read about some kind of controversial, you know, activity that people are involved in, uh, you know, we think of the sexual stuff that goes on, uh, marriage and transgender and all that. Um, what do people say? No one has the right to tell me what to do. Or I have the freedom to live my life as I choose. And nobody bats an eye at that. It's assumed that that's true. And, and that's why reading books like uh, author Tim Keller is really good at, at getting a handle on that and helping us to understand how to talk to people that way because there's a part of me that just wants to you know like do the hollow coconut sound on their head and say McFly you know do you realize what you're saying because if everybody lives that way you have anarchy and, and what is the United States heading towards exactly that everybody just gets to do what they want and um, even in the political world and I'll, I'll risk being a little political here you know one of our parties really focuses on everybody gets to, to do what they want Nobody can, can curtail your freedoms. And, and that's very, very dangerous. Uh, not just politically, but especially spiritually. And Samson's a great, a great picture of that. You're supposed to listen to your mom and dad? Nah, get her for me. You're supposed to marry a believer? Nah, she's right in my eyes. I'm just going to do what I want. No one can tell me what to do. And, and to me, that's such a close parallel with where our, our culture is today. And that's true in the church as well. I was talking to Pastor Kyle today and uh, about this this chapter, and we were talking about how how things have changed so much in churches across North America um, and and things that used to bother people. Uh, I read an article some years ago. A pastor was asked to write an article, and, and the person said, I want you to write an article that talks about how the greatest danger in marriage today is homosexual marriage. And the guy said, okay, I'll, I'll do something. And he went home, and he started doing some research, and he says, I can't write the article. And And... The other person said, well, why not? He said, because the greatest danger to marriage today is divorce. You see, he saw that divorce now has become so acceptable. Even in churches, nobody bats an eye. Now, I'm not talking about all churches and so forth. But I'm just saying, in general, that's what we see sweeping across the land. So I think it's something we have to be, be very much aware of. Now, what is this business here where... God comes in, let's see what verse it is here, uh, verse 4, they did not know it was from the Lord who was seeking an occasion to confront the Philistines, because at that time they were ruling. So what does that mean? Is God saying, well, for here we'll break the rules? No. 
But what he is saying, I will use even the stupid stuff my people do for good. And God, God wanted to use Samson as a Nazarite. Remember, before birth, his parents were told, no alcohol, don't cut his hair. Uh, those were signs of the Nazarite vow, which means you are set apart, you're dedicated. And he was going to be dedicated to the Lord. Think of Samuel, the little boy. He was dedicated to the Lord. And he grew up the right way, right? He was worshiping God, faithful to God, all those good things. And God used Samuel in mighty ways. Samson just went his own way, but God still used him. So when it says here, this was from the Lord, it's not saying God said, yeah, go ahead and marry whoever you want. Cross those boundaries. I don't care. What, what, what it's saying is the Lord is using that. And so he's going he's gonna to get in there and, and make good stuff happen for Israel, even through our weaknesses and sins. And I would wager, and I won't ask you to share examples, but I would wager in your life, because I can think of my own life, stupid things I've done, even sins I've committed. I've seen God work uh, good through that. And, and maybe a good example of that is when you're raising kids and, you know, like when I was a kid, um, you know, my dad caught me lying. And that was very painful for me. But it ended up really strengthening my relationship with my father because he forgave me. Um, thinking about my dad a lot, even uh, <laughs> just when I was learning to drive, I was 17 and my family went on vacation. I stayed home because I was playing soccer. We had practice. And he said, okay, you can drive the car, but just to and, to and from school. It was like a 10 minute drive. So I'm driving down the road. I was like, I'm driving. I'm by myself. This is awesome. And I see a car coming towards me. The other lane. Hey, that looks like my friend Brian. When I turn around, the, the light had turned red. Now it's going very slowly. And I went dunk, right into the back of a van. Minimal damage. Um, but the hood of the car, our car, was buckled. Nobody got hurt. I mean, it was very minor. But that was probably on a Friday. And my family didn't come home till Sunday afternoon. I was just in agony agony for days and my dad was so calm about it and so forgiving and loving that it, it, it strengthened that relationship and so God can use even weaknesses even sins to accomplish his will and that's that's a miracle you know and I think that must drive Satan crazy think about Job you know Satan just afflicted Job terribly and God used that for good it's a book in the Bible millions of people have been strengthened and encouraged by that book and Satan meant to to, to bring doubt to the highest level possible. God did the exact opposite. Okay, so we already read uh, Judges 13.1, and that's where it says he sold them or delivered them into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. What does verse 4 say? So uh, look at 14.4. And, and so what was the status quo in Israel? I know I'm making you think on a Wednesday evening. It's so unfair. Do you, do you mean politically or culturally? Politically, yeah. And or culturally. I mean, just what was life like for Israel for Pretty 40 years? bad because Chaos. the Philistines were yeah. not very good rulers. Well, they may have been, they may not have been. But, but the point is they were being ruled. Yeah. And that's, that's the Hebrew verb there. They were being ruled by the Philistines. What's wrong with this picture? We're going to be ruled by our, the, the covenant of the Lord. That's right. You're the Israelites. You're the people of the Lord. God rescued you from slavery in Egypt. He made you into a mighty people, and you came into the promised land and conquered much of it. And now due to your sin, you're being ruled. You're not slaves, but you're close. Uh, and there's some other verses in here. Uh, let's take a look at 1 Samuel 13, 19 to 20. I'm sorry I didn't, I, I'm sorry I didn't put that in your... In your study guide, you might want to write it down. First Samuel 13, verses 19 and 20. Now, this is a little bit later, uh, after the period of the judges, but not that much. All right, so, uh, First Samuel 13, verses 19 and 20. Did I? Oh, I'm looking the wrong one. Okay. Okay, 
So not a blacksmith could be found in the whole land of Israel because the Philistines had said, otherwise the Hebrews will make swords or spears. So all Israel went down to the Philistines to have their plowshares, mattocks, axes, and sickles sharpened. The price was two-thirds of a shekel for sharpening plowshares and mattocks, and a third of a shekel for sharpening forks and axes and for repointing goads. So on the day of the battle, not a soldier with Saul and Jonathan had a sword or spear in his hand. Only Saul and his son Jonathan had them. So this is later. So it may be worse than Samson. It may be a little better. I don't know. But it's still bad. And so what's the status quo? You're a subject people. For 40 years. And people had accepted it. You know, I think it's Dave Ramsey who notes that, um, of all things at a financial seminar, he notes that when Israel came out of Egypt, then they wanted to go back. Why? Because they were still thinking of themselves as slaves. I think that's a really good insight. That's all they knew. And so Israel has been free, but now the Philistines have just encroached and encroached, and they have, they have iron and swords and so forth. The, the Israelites don't. And, and so they've just accepted it. This is how life is. And so in, in the life of Samson, again, which is before Samuel, God is saying, wake up. I need to do something to wake my people up. They're just accepting of this. And so something needs to change. So what are some ways that we sometimes just quit trying and accept sin? This is a dangerous question, I know. So you have to give me like a hypothetical answer, right? Well, what are some ways that we sometimes just quit trying? You ever felt, I, I mean, I feel that way sometimes. Yeah, Gretchen. Uh, when there's a math problem that's too difficult. <laughs> exactly. Yep. And, you know, it doesn't go away as you get older, does it? You look at your finances. It's like, how, how do I make this work? Yeah, well, you can cut some corners here and there, right? And and so sometimes we just quit trying. You know, for me, I'll give you an example from my life. When I was a teenager, I had a bad problem with language. Cursing, swearing, those kind of things, taking God's name in vain. And, and, you know, for a while, I was like, well, it's just how it is. It took me a long time to, to work on that. And sometimes I still wrestle with that. Uh, and so sin can sort of drag you down and, and get you to a place of just quitting trying. Now, I give kind of safe examples. There's obviously far more serious ones. Think of someone who is addicted to drugs, alcohol, pornography, spending money, you know, shopping, gambling. You know, we talked a little bit about that before the class began. And, and if you're there, and, and uh, I, I've talked to some people over the years who've been addicts, and it's really sad when, when they talk to you and they're, they're despairing. They just say, I, I quit. I give up. I'll never be able to be free of this. And, and that's really a discouraging conversation. You know, I, I, I've been doing a unit in my psychology class on states of consciousness, and we started by talking about nicotine and vaping, and these kids are getting hooked on it. Because those those jewels have um, those little pods have as much nicotine as a pack of cigarettes. Wow! So they overindulge in it, and they're all amped up on this nicotine, which is a huge stimulant, races their heart and stuff. But then they're sitting out looking out the window; they can't think of anything else but getting out of the classroom so that they can, you know, hit this. You know, and I don't know how they afford those because you know <laughs> I don't know how they get a hold of the stuff that they do. Yeah. But then we we switched. And we started talking about marijuana and. They, you know, we watched a video that kind of looked at all the different angles about it. And there's this one kid who could have been a pro golfer, but he had a couple bad breakups. He's been a little bit bad, started smoking marijuana. And, you know, 10 years later, he's, all he wants to do is sit on his couch and smoke. Yep. And he says, I don't like myself. Yep. And because when he smokes, he just obsesses over the, his failures. Yep. And he can't get out of that, but he doesn't want to change anything. Yep. So it's a, it, it becomes that I'd rather just sit on my couch and smoke marijuana than go out and be productive or be the best that I can be. Yep. And it was really depressing to watch that about this, you know, this Canadian kid. You know? yep. was, yeah, if you want to read a good book that describes it, it's called The Addictive Personality by a guy named Craig Nacken. Uh, I taught a class that was based on that book a few years ago. And, and addiction is a terrible thing. It, it's, a, it's, it's like a spiral. And so... Uh, you're feeling you go down you're, you're in this low spot and you get here and you have a choice do I talk to my friend or do I smoke a little marijuana or drink a little or whatever it might be and, and if I do that activity I feel a little bit better at short term but then I go a little bit lower the next time and, and so you have this cycle that just keeps going down and down and down 
until you get to that place where the only hope you have of feeling good is if I do the activity, whatever that may be, or smoke the drug, whatever. And, and, and people cannot see that there is another way when they get too bad that way. And, and I, I really believe that if uh, the Apostle Paul were writing, you know, the book of Romans today, he says, you know, uh, every, or Jesus says, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. And, and Paul t talks about, you know, in my heart, I love the Lord, but in my body, I'm a slave to sin. I think today he might use the term addict. He might say, you know, I, in my, my mind, I love God, but I, I'm an addict to sin in my heart. Because it, that's exactly what sin does. It's that constant trying to feel better. And that's not a bad thing. We all want to feel better. But this, this can be very, very dangerous. And so that's where sin gets a hold of us. And when you see someone who's wrapped up in addiction, it's very discouraging. Now, in verses 3 to 9, what indications do we get that Samson did not respect his parents? So if you look at those verses, what, what did you see in verses 3 to 9 that showed he didn't respect his parents? The way he demands and talks to yeah. them. You're supposed to, you're supposed to respect. They, they're, a, they're, they're your elders, yep. and you need to respect them. You don't demand things of them. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the Mosaic Law, which, of course, everybody had by then, because Moses lived before the time of the judges said that if, if a son, um, well, what's the term? Uh, it's not abuses his, his parents, but it's kind of like disrespects them. He shot me put to death. I mean, this was serious stuff. And Samson just blows that away. Uh, any other indications? There, there's a kind of a... What about when he gives his parents this, this polluted honey? And yes. The, you know, the Jewish tradition is so careful about not becoming unclean. Right? Yeah. And to, to being holy. And so I imagine that something coming out of the body of a wild animal that's decaying. Oh, you must stole my thunder be... stuff. That's <laughs> absolutely right. Yeah, I'm glad, I'm glad you picked up on that because what was what was Samson supposed to be for his whole life? A Nazarite. A dedicated servant of the Lord. A special, again, don't cut the hair, don't drink alcohol. Even while she was pregnant, his mom wasn't supposed to drink alcohol. And so he's dedicated to the Lord. And those people were not to touch anything dead. It made them unclean. And, and, and that was true for regular people. If you touch a dead body of any kind, human or animal, that made you unclean for so many days. And so Samson scrapes out with his hands honey from this dead animal and then gives it to his parents without telling them. Defiles them. Yeah, he defiles them, and they don't even know it. So, yeah, there's some real indications there that he doesn't respect his parents. Uh, the text points points out that finding the honey was a surprise. Uh, again, your translation was great. It says, behold, there was honey in there. Um, we'll come back to that later. The text is pointing that out for a reason. Uh, verse 9 reveals that Samson didn't really respect the vow of the Nazarite either. And that's, he willingly made himself unclean. He didn't care. He just didn't care. I'm going to do what I want to do. You can't stop me. That's yeah, Samson. I can imagine that even back in the day, if something, if honey came out of a dead animal that was decaying, I mean, that just gives us the blues, right? So I can't imagine it not giving anyone the, you know. Yeah, if you've got a dead animal there, it's, but you know, you, you talk to guys, uh, Beth was watching this uh, survival show. It was very interesting. They took survivalist experts uh, who are, they know how to handle themselves out in, in Mother Nature with no, no man-made stuff. And I think it was a, a kind of like a game a contest, and there were I don't know ten or twelve of these people, and they threw them in different parts of the the Yukon, up uh, in the Arctic Circle, and they had to survive. And and you see those people, and it's like, well, one guy shot a squirrel with the bow and arrow, so that you know that's edible meat. But I mean, the other people say, well, they're you know eating bugs, worms. You talk to the military, they talk about survival, you know. And I think Samson was a pretty rough character, and he just didn't care, just didn't care. All right, verses 10 to 14. Now his father went down to see the woman, and Samson made a feast there, as was customary for bridegrooms. When he appeared, he was given 30 companions. Let me tell you a riddle, Samson said to them. If you can give me the answer within the seven days of the feast, I will give you 30 linen garments and 30 sets of clothes. If you can't tell me the answer, you must give me 30 linen garments and 30 sets of clothes. Tell us your riddle, they said. Let's hear it. He replied, out of the eater, something to eat. Out of the strong, something sweet. For three days, they could not give the answer. All right. So we know the answer because we're reading the, 
the story, but they had no idea. Now, isn't it interesting? Samson here is the host, not his dad. Is that a Philistine custom? We're not sure. And that's where, like I said before, this chapter raises questions. This one isn't a very serious question, of course, but it's just, was that the custom or was Samson just being the wayward guy he wanted to be? Maybe in the Philistine culture, the sons gave the feast. The companions bring up very, very interesting questions. Uh, why did I say that? Huh. huh, there's no questions in there. We have a oh, paper. what's that? We have questions on our paper. No, I know. I I'm just saying, why did I write this? Oh. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I just got to keep going. That's my problem. What would I do without my wife? I'd have no, I don't have a brain without her. All right. So here's the questions that their appearance brings up. First of all, does Samson have no friends? And I think it's conspicuous to note that nobody comes with Samson except his parents. And even there, they're kind of in and out of the story. They're not major characters. Are they rent to friends? I mean, was that a Philistine custom that if someone was getting married and they didn't have their own friends, you gave them a bunch of guys, you know, and here, I don't know if they had a bachelor party, but they're all together, you know, hey, you're getting married, good for you. Or were they there to watch him? In other words, was there already some animosity between Samson and the Philistines? We don't know. Now, the riddle would be impossible to solve. Why? Because only Samson had seen the honey inside the carcass. Bees inside a carcass are very rare. I said is very rare. I should probably say are very rare. But um, that's not common. I've read some other commentaries about this. It's very unusual for bees to do this. And so how would you guess that? And Samson had told no one about this event, including his parents, which is not horribly shocking, is it? Now, the bets placed on the riddle were expensive. Now, you and I might not think so. Why? Because we live in a culture where we can buy more clothes than we know what to do with. You know, the old joke, right? Oh, I have nothing to wear. And you're looking in a closet, and there's like 40 different things to wear. Yeah. But in that culture, you would have maybe, a, unless you were wealthy, wealthy people, of course, had lots. But if you were an average person, you'd have a set of work clothes and a set of nice clothes. And so Samson comes in, and he says, okay, if you win the bet, I'll give you 30 sets of clothing. But if I win the bet, you can't figure out my riddle. I get 30. I mean, he's got to make himself wealthy. Every one of those guys is going to have to find him a garment. And the garments there are undergarments plus, uh, that's one of the words, and then the other one is the overgarment. So it's the whole kit and caboodle. It's going to men's warehouse and getting everything. Okay, let's go to verses 15 to 18 and find out the answer to the riddle. On the fourth day, and by the way, does anyone's Bible have the seventh day? No? Okay. On the fourth day, they said to Samson's wife, and by the way, here's why I asked that. The Hebrew text says seventh day. I have seventh. You have seventh? Okay, what, what translation do you have? Um, King James. New King James, New King James, yep. So the Hebrew text, which is generally the most reliable, has seventh day. Um, and one of the commentators that I looked at, he actually accepts that. Now, the Greek translation of the Old Testament and a few Syriac uh, manuscripts have the fourth day, and that's how most English translations go. Is it super important? Probably not. Well, on the fourth day, they said to Samson's wife, coax your husband into explaining the riddle for us, or we will burn you and your father's house to death. Did you invite us here to rob us? And Samson's wife threw herself on him, sobbing, you hate me. You don't really love me. You've given my people a riddle, but you haven't told me the answer. I haven't even explained it to my father or mother, he replied. So why should I explain it to you? She cried the whole seven days of the feast. So on the seventh day, he finally told her because she continued to press him. She in turn explained the riddle to her people. Before sunset on the seventh day, the men of the town said to him, What is sweeter than honey? What is stronger than a lion? Samson said to them, if you had not plowed with my heifer, you would not have solved my riddle. <laughs> oh my gosh, this is fun. Okay. 
at the end of verse 15, um, it says, did you invite us here to rob us? Again, I'll ask uh, Wayne with your ESV. What does it say at the end of verse 15? Impoverish. Impoverish us? Okay. So this is a very significant Hebrew verb. It literally means to dispossess. And it's the main verb that's used when the Israelites come into the land and they dispossess the Canaanites. They disinherit them. And, and the author of this book is probably helping us to see what's going on here. Whose land is it anyway? Is it the Philistines or is it Israel's? Yahweh says it's Israel's. And so they're beginning to point toward these kinds of things. Uh, when it says, tell us and find out, or we're going to burn you and your father's household to death. When it says household, the house of your father, it probably means the, the members of the family. In verses 16 and 17, the word people highlights the loyalties of Samson's wife. So let's let's look at this. So in, in verse 16, uh, you hate me. You don't really love me. You've given my people a riddle. And then in verse 17, let's see if I can find it here. She in turn explained the riddle to her people. So where are her loyalties? They're not with Samson. No. Um, and, and I forgot to mention, um, let's see, sometime later in verse 8, so we got this betrothal period. That's the beginning of verse 8. And Samson goes back home. And so there's this time period of betrothal. And do they get closer? Do they have this nice relationship? No. And so she's still connected to her people more than she's connected to him. And by Uh, Samson's weaknesses with women are revealed here. We will see them again. That, that got him in trouble over and over and over again. And Samson describes his wife like a piece of property. Where do you see that? She's a heifer. Yeah, she's a heifer. You plowed with my heifer. She's a tool. That's not how you generally talk about your spouse. right? Don't do that. It's a bad idea. Now, the description of the men in Timnah has also changed. How are they described, first of all, in verse 11? What do you see there? Companions. Right, so there's 30 companions. Now let's look at verses 16 and 17. We just looked at it. Right, people. people, right. So first they're companions for Samson. Now they're the people of his wife. And finally then, in verse 18, what do we see? Men of the city. Men of the town or men of the city. Yeah, so it, it completely changes. And that's why one commentator thinks these 30 guys are not there to be his buddies. But they're more about, we're going to watch him. He's dangerous. We don't like him. And so on. What they do is treacherous and, and, and dishonest as well. They take uh -huh. up this bet and then they start accusing him, right? So it's... Yeah, I mean, they're, they're ruthless people themselves. Kind of fits in with what you were saying about yeah, the Philistines they're, before. They're very Philistine. Of them. Yeah, yes, it is. <laughs> and they're, they're, they threaten a, a woman who's lived in their town. Hey, we'll burn you to death with all your family if you don't find out. That's pretty hardcore, isn't it? Okay, 19 and 20. Now we get to the end of the chapter. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon him in power. He went down to Ashkelon, struck down 30 of their men, stripped them of their belongings, and gave their clothes to those who had explained the riddle. Burning with anger, he went up to his father's house. The Samson's wife was given to the friend who had attended him at his wedding. <laughs> Best man gets to meet his wife. Oh, man. So the breach grows here between uh, Samson and the Philistines. So we read here that this literally says the spirit of Yahweh rushed upon Samson again. I say again because in verse 6, if you look back in the text, that's when this lion comes out roaring and attacks him. And, and so what it appears is that when the Holy Spirit rushed upon Samson, he was given incredible power. Uh, he was able to tear that lion with, apart with his bare hands. That's crazy powerful. And when he does, and I think I have a map coming up here, when he goes to Ashkelon, we'll see how far that was in just a minute. Oh, no, I forgot. I forgot to put the map in. So, Okay. So I, I did some research on it. Ashkelon is another of the five cities of the Philistines. 
It's about 23 miles away from Timno. So this is some serious power, right? He's, he goes down there. I don't know how long it took him. He may have taken his time to walk down there, but he's furious. The Hebrew idiom for anger says his nose got hot. That's what it says. And it says, so his nose got hot. And he went down to Ashkelon, and he killed 30 men and took their clothing. And then brought it to them. Now, I don't know if that means there was blood on the clothing. You know, who knows? Um, but then he had to go 23 miles back. Now, think about it. If someone comes to your town and kills 30 men, what are you going to do? You're going to be all over that guy. You're going to call out all the troops, the police, whatever you've got. And so he's able to go down there, kill 30 guys, which in itself is pretty amazing. Take their clothes and bundle them up, put them on a beast of burden. I don't know. It doesn't tell us. And then make it back without getting tracked down and killed. So there's definitely supernatural strength that's, that's going on here. And we'll see that in Samson's life several times. Uh, and uh, sometimes people will look at the Bible and say it's impossible. Just impossible. Um, well, first of all, nothing is impossible for God. Second, we've all seen those like Dateline TV shows from... They don't show them anymore, but like 15 years ago, like when somebody was on PCP, that drug, and the cops would try to, you know, there'd be five cops, and he'd be throwing them left and right. And he's just a little guy. How does he do that? Well, he's on some weird drug that gives him incredible energy and power. So if a drug can do that, if the Holy Spirit rushes on Samson, he's going to be able to kill a lion. He's going to be able to kill 30 men. He's going to be able to make it back to Tindal with these clothes and, you know, throw them in their face or whatever he did with them. And then he goes back home, and his wife is given away. Okay, so uh, I did put a map in. Yay! Okay, so here's Timna, way over here, and down here is Ashkelon. Oh, Ashdod, that's another of the five cities. So Gath, Ekron, Ashdod, Ashkelon, and I still can't remember the fifth one. But um, anyways, it's about 23 mile distance that he's going. He's walking through a hot desert too. I don't know what the weather is, but uh, yeah, if it's yeah, winter, he's know. okay. But obviously, we got some supernatural power going on here, and we'll see that later when he picks up the jawbone of an ass, you know, and he kills a thousand guys. It's just, I mean, it, it, we look at it, it's like Marvel movies, right? It's Iron Man or something mm -hmm. like that. But it's the real deal. But you know what makes me sad is that those arch books and stuff when you were a kid, and I grew up on those. Samson's like this cool guy, he's a martyr, you know, died, you know, in the temple, blah, blah, blah. They leave out all the gory, you know, details, and then they never talk about how he was a sinner and a, oh, just, a, a disrespectful person. They, yeah. they, 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 he's glorified in yep. the children's stories. And the heroes so of the Bible. Disappointing. It is disappointing. <laughs> because kids need to know the truth, right? They need to know that Samson isn't some great hero to emulate. I would never want my son to be like Samson, ever. Um, and it's a tragedy. He set, he's set aside from before birth by God to be this Nazarite, and he just goes his own way. Now, God will use that, but um, it's a tragedy. It's a tragedy for Israel. Uh, you know, Samson never leads the people toward Yahweh, does he? And never do we see him saying, let's return to the Lord. Let's let's open up the Book of the Covenant. Let's learn. Let's, let's be pure. Let's turn away from our gods. No. He's out there marrying Philistine women, slaughtering guys. You know, it's it's kind of a tragic story. And yet it's not the lowest point of the book. We're, we're still a few chapters away. Yeah, so. <laughs> <laughs> All right, any questions or comments before we close here today? Now, Samson's not a leader at this time. Well, Samson never really is totally a leader of, of other people. He never is like... Uh, what was that guy's name? Deborah and Barak. You know, Barak was the soldier. You never see Samson getting together, calling out the Ephraimites to fight the Philistines. You, you never see him doing that. He's kind of a one-man show. He just does what he wants to do. He's a wild card. It's crazy. He's a crazy man. It's the story that he was supposed to be that, but even before he had the opportunity, he's on his own. Yeah, we don't know exactly, you know, what God would have had in mind. You know, as a Nazarite, you would be, you know, John the Baptist live that way as well. You know, maybe he would have been someone like that to call the people to repent, but we, we just don't know. Oh, oh. We would just be speculating. But I, what we do I know thought is... he was one of the judges. He is. He is one of the judges. So when does he become judge? He doesn't judge. Like Remember, the, the term judge in the book of Judges means leader. 
And no, that's what I meant. He's, he's never. He's not him. leading. He's not leading the people. No, but he's fighting for them. He's kind of. Okay. You know, this is what he does. You know, you do see him interact with some of the villages in Israel, as we read in the next couple of chapters. Um, like the Philistines will come and surround the town, and the and of course the people of of uh, Israel are scared because they don't have weapons, and the Philistines are going to kill us all. And, and there's one of them where he says, "Well, just bind me with with new ropes." I'll be weak like anybody else, and then comes out there and snaps the ropes and picks up the jawbone of ass and kills them. So, you know, that's that's about the extent of his leadership in Israel. But I think that's the point. You start with Othniel, a judge who does everything right, and he goes through these different judges. Remember how it's gotten worse and worse? Yeah. Uh, for example, we got to Gideon. Remember, the first part of the story is um, there's a there's a shrine to Baal and an Asherah pole in his hometown, and by the end of his life, there's one back there in his hometown. So he didn't really purify the people. And during his lifetime, that's the first judge, during his lifetime, the people went back to worship other gods. The other judges had always said, all through his life, they were faithful. But then when the guy died, they went back to the other gods. When in Gideon, it starts getting worse. Uh, and you start seeing Israelite on Israelite violence in the story of Gideon. And then Jephthah comes in, and it's even more. So, so we're spiraling down, and we get to this last judge, and he's the worst of them all in terms of leading Israel toward Yahweh, being faithful, holding up the word of God, you know. He's not good at it at all. Sad, isn't it? So again, what you know, what do we do with this book? Um, we have to take it in the context of the whole Old Testament and, and the whole Bible. Uh, God is mentioned in, in the book of Judges as he's the only one labeled with the term judge. God is. And so when you see Jesus come, Jesus was set aside before birth, wasn't he? You will conceive and bear a son. He would be pure and holy. And he did it right, as opposed to where Samson did it wrong. Jesus touched death. Unlike Samson, who did it for his own gain to get honey uh, and killed his enemies, Jesus died for his enemies. He became unclean so we could be cleansed. So I think you have to always bring that in. Otherwise, you can read the book of Judges and go, this is depressing. Other thoughts before we close tonight? Look at the clock. I'm done early. This never happens. It's like five till. You're welcome. All right. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for sending Jesus to be our leader, our rescuer, our savior. Because he did it the right way and died instead of killing his enemies. We have life in him. As we go home tonight, help us to think about maybe how we let sin encroach in our lives and we just don't care anymore. We don't bother with it. We pray for our culture that really pushes people toward this idea that we're all free to just do whatever we want. No one can tell us what to do. Help us to listen to you because you have our best in mind. And as we hear the gospel and share it with other people, good things happen. Help us to do that this week. In Jesus' name, amen.